Good morning. Uh, this is Ian Beale from uh, CB, and welcome to today's uh, webinar that we are running uh, together with the IRM on information risk best practice ERM responses. Uh, very pleased to be uh, running the session. This is my first webinar for the IRM uh, 2017. I ran a number last year uh, and look forward to running both this one and, uh, and others during the course of 2017. Um, by way of introduction, if you haven't joined uh, a we previous webinar that, that I've run, uh, I work for a company called CEB. We're a best practice insight and research uh, organization. Amongst the corporate functions that we uh, conduct research and provide uh, best practice insight is information security. Um, we have similar programs that provide support for heads of finance, heads of uh, shared services, HR, IT, etc. Um, but I work in the risk and audit team, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to be hosting this morning's webinar. Um, we've got a good number of you uh, that have joined, so a very warm welcome. And uh, I'll be—you uh, can sit back and relax. I'll be advancing the slides, so uh, no need you, for you to take uh, take any action. You can simply uh, watch, watch, and listen. If you do have a question, you should see on your screen a, a button you can click. If you do have a question. Um, and we'll try and answer uh, the questions as, as we go through, uh, where they're going to be relevant to, to a broad number, of, uh, broad number of people. And right at the end uh, of the presentation, there's going to be a, a URL listed on the last page. So if you do want to download and, and have access to the webinar material I'm going to be using, you, you can do that. So you'll be able to uh, get hold of the, the whole presentation material, uh, and we'll tell you how right, right at the end. Um, I'm also uh, hoping to be joined by uh, panelists. You can see at the bottom there, Richard Cross. Uh, we're looking forward to, to Richard contributing to, to the webinar uh, this morning and bringing his, uh, his perspective and his expertise. So let me just uh, give you a little bit more information about me, uh, and then I will also introduce Richard. So uh, I've been here at CB uh, providing advice to our risk and audit clients across EMEA. We have about 120 clients at the moment, uh, risk clients uh, across the Europe, Middle East and Africa region, about 150, 160 uh, audit clients. And I'm part of a team that, uh, a global team, so I have colleagues in North America, uh, in Asia and in Australia, New Zealand, who also provide support in a similar way to our clients and member organizations uh, in, in those regions. So I say I've been here about six years, six and a half years almost now. And before that, I was a chief risk officer at a number of companies. And a few years before that, I was at a company you've probably heard of called PwC. Um, uh, let me just introduce Richard. Hello, everybody. Uh, morning, Richard. Good to hear your voice. Here's a picture of Richard and just a uh, praise of, of his experience, wealth of experience uh, in operational roles, uh, but also running his own uh, consulting company now. And right at the end, uh, we'll give you a little bit of an insight. Richard's going to be running uh, a course on this information security area for the I IRM uh, during February next month, and we'll give you some more insight into that course at, uh, at the end of the session. And in terms of logistics, how this is going to work, I'm going to be uh, talking through various topics uh, and turning to Richard to get his input and perspective on those. So you're, you're going to be hearing from CB but also hearing from, uh, from Richard uh, and getting his, uh, his viewpoint on uh, a number of the areas that we're going to be talking through uh, during, during this morning's session. So let me explain how this is going to be structured. Uh, I'm going to be talking through these, these four areas. So uh, an introduction to information security. Um, some of you, I'm sure, are experienced in information security. Some of you may be less so. So I'm just going to give a, a quick run through of some of the basics, the, the fundamentals, uh, some numbers, and some of the reasons why information security is so important now. Um, look in more detail then at the, the threat landscape. Um, talk about some of the major frameworks and, and regulations that, that uh, come into play in the information security area, and then spend time talking about, so what can ERM uh, be doing to help uh, the organizations you work for uh, or support uh, be best placed to, to manage their, their information security in, in this tough and challenging and indeed fast-moving uh, part of the world. So that's, that's how we're going to, uh, to, uh, to, to spend the time together. Um, we've got 60 minutes to, to run this session, so let's get, sta let's get started and start uh, looking into that first area. Always good to start with a definition as to what we mean. Um, there are multiple definitions of information security. Here's one that, that we use and, and, and we work with. Um, 
my job is not to read out everything that's on the screen. Um, you're, you're perfectly able to do that. So I'm going to give you, you know, a, some words around, some extra color, a, a different perspective, uh, additional uh, commentary. So what I would say in terms of describing uh, a definition or trying to, to define information, it's all around three, three attributes from, from my perspective that you're trying to ensure that your data is available uh, whenever you need it whether that's 24-7 or, or whatever the time scales that, 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 that you work to. But availability is a key attribute of information security. Uh, completeness is a second, so the data needs to be complete. Um, that can include accurate, that can include up-to-date, but complete in a very broad sense. Your data is, is complete, so you see the whole picture. Uh, and the, the third thing is around security that the right people have access to the right data in the right way. So those that uh, need access to read it can do that. Those that have the privilege to update it or create it or delete it have that privilege. And those that have none indeed have no access. So availability, security, uh, and completeness are key components of um, information security, uh, whatever your definition, whichever um, standard or regulation you're using to, those are essential uh, building blocks, if you like, or components uh, of information security in addition to what's, uh, what's on the screen there. Let's look at some numbers. Um, three, three, things on, three things on here uh, I want to highlight. Um, at CEB, we do a state of the function survey. So we survey all our risk management clients across the globe. We do that uh, every year. And you won't be surprised to hear, I'm sure, that information security, information risk was the number one specific risk or uh, priority area identified by heads of ERM in 2016. Um, in addition to that, you can see the second bullet point uh, from the top there. In addition to that, boards of directors are very worried about it. Um, because they see uh, a lot of the stories that we see about companies having their uh, information security hacked or uh, service denied uh, or uh, in other ways uh, personal data of customers or employees being breached and uh, published or made available on, on the internet. So board of directors um, are very concerned about this and it's their top, uh, top uh, concern, their top risk. Uh, so it's a very big concern for boards as well as for uh, ERM teams and heads of ERM. Um, the second thing, um, again, perhaps not surprising, but it's always good to, to reinforce and make sure we're, we're on the same page here, um, it's getting worse. Uh, the number of threats, number of incidents uh, increased from 2014 to 15 and from 15 to 16. Uh, the cost of those breaches, um, this is calculated typically by looking at uh, the cost of personal data breaches, so uh, cost of remediation, cost of informing all of those customers that their records have been uh, breached, uh, fines and penalties, uh, costs of resolution and improvement. Uh, on average, $4 million, you can see there, per, per breach. Uh, and the, the complexity uh, of managing information security continues to, to increase. So we can see there the, the third bullet point in that section that our InfoSec teams needing to analyze double the amount of security data. This is because of the number of people that are accessing systems, that the variety of threats and sources of those threats, as well as the volume of data that needs, needs to be protected. Uh, and finally, um, an area that, or a theme that we're going to focus on, there's a lot of things you can do to try and prevent and to succeed in preventing uh, information security breaches. And it's a combination of two things. It's called their security hygiene. Uh, essentially, it, it, it's two things. It, it's a combination of technology. Fundamentally, uh, technology is very important as building your barriers or building security. Things like up-to-date versions of software, uh, routine patching, um, installing uh, antivirus, uh, network protection software, etc. But that is certainly is not the sole uh, requirement. You have to have people behaving well. Um, so behavior of people or co uh, corporate culture, whatever you want to call it, uh, together with technology uh, are both essential building blocks or components of effective information security. Indeed, from our research, we know how important behavior is. Uh, when we did this research about a year, perhaps 18 months ago, uh, by, interview, uh, by surveying hundreds and thousands of employees, so not risk specialists by any means, but employees, 93% of them 
uh, acknowledged that they had circumvented the information security controls at their organization. So they knew what the policy was. They had been trained and, and they knowingly circumvented it because they typically because they perceived it to be burdensome. Uh, so behavior of employees and other people who are inside your house, whether they're contractors or consultants or third parties that you're connected to, um, uh, is very important. So we'll be talking about that towards the end. Um, I've just seen a couple of you have sent in a question about uh, the audio being, being poor. Um, so I've just turned the volume up and hopefully that's going to, uh, going to help uh, everybody uh, hearing, hearing what, I'm, what I'm saying here. So behavior and technology, two essential uh, components. Uh, and the third component, which we'll come back to uh, later on, is also governance. And that means in terms of roles and responsibility. Who is responsible for information security? Uh, and is that clear? Is that unambiguous? Uh, do the roles of ERM, uh, the CISO, the data privacy officer, etc., are they clear and unambiguous? Uh, is there no overlap and, and no gaps uh, there? So that's, that's trying to set the scene for you. Why is it particularly important now? We've just seen how important it is when we surveyed ERM leaders, how important it is when we've surveyed boards of directors. Um, summarizing here, four magnifiers. And I'm going to explain these, and then once I've done that, I'm going to turn to, to Richard and ask for his, his perspective on the, this, this opening context setting, a couple of pages that we've been, we've been talking through. So let me explain these, these four breaches. I'm going to start top left, insecure employee behaviors. Um, in addition to what, um, what I said on the previous page, about 93%, you can see here one in two breaches are the results of insecure employee behavior. Um, so getting your employees, your colleagues in your organization, uh, and you need to consider not just employees, of course, but contractors and consultants and others that are working inside and for your organization. Moving clockwise around that, uh, increasing sophistication of threats. The, the number of threats and their sophistication and the speed in which different attack vectors are developed and used and deployed is increasingly quick. Um, 2015, 60% of external attacks which uh, were compromised their targets within minutes. In 2016, it was 90%. So 60% of external attacks compromised or succeeded uh, in 2015 within minutes. In 2016, it was 90% of attacks were successful within minutes. Um, so sophistication and speed. Third-party vulnerabilities. Again, you don't need me to tell you that you, you're working for organizations where you are increasingly interconnected. Your systems are interconnected either with your customers because they're choosing to uh, select and buy uh, products or services from you uh, through their phones or tablets or on, in other way online. And at the other end of the supply chain, you're could well be connected to various suppliers, service suppliers, uh, or supply chain in terms of products. Um, so you are, you are typically working in an extended enterprise, uh, and that enterprise is connected through systems and, and technology. Uh, and therefore, you're exposed to breaches at a third party, or indeed at a fourth party. Uh, so if your third parties have themselves subcontracted or outsourced. And then finally, uh, bottom, the growing attacks. Uh, different types of attacks um, and uh, different different rationales, and we'll come back to rationales and drivers um, and uh, uh, reasons that uh, people are attacking. But we're seeing, for example, uh, attacks for financial gain. We're seeing attacks for uh, uh, striving for physical damage. Um, whether those are attacking power stations in other countries, whether there have been attacks uh, from third parties on power stations in, th in other countries. Political concerns, I'm sure we've all read the news about, uh, in the US, uh, concerns about uh, hacks into uh, political uh, campaigns, uh, emails, or indeed voting uh, systems. Uh, targeting intellectual properties. Um, so actually stealing intellectual properties, that's, that can be the goal for some, uh, some uh, threats and some attacks. Uh, and finally, denial of service. So you simply want to prevent an organization uh, being able to be uh, digitally pre uh, present, digitally ac accessible um, by denying service. And we'll talk a little bit more about those, those motives and, and those uh, rationales. But let me pause here momentarily. Richard, I've just uh, gone through a number of things to, to set the scene and provide context. What would you, what would you add to those, those opening words, those opening comments I, I, I've made? 
Well, I think if uh, a lot of people who are responsible for information security at the coalface in their organizations would recognize that scale and complexity come together, and it creates a problem where people really don't know where the crown jewels of their information assets really reside within the organization. And this becomes part of the problem of separating out, um, the, 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 you know, finding the needle in the haystack, the chaff from the wheat. So what are the key things which really matter to your organization that you would, um, you would really suffer if you lost that information? Um, being able to tell where that is in terms of the myriad information systems that are available, data sets, servers, applications, members of staff. It's really, really difficult to know what counts. So you're left with the problem. Do you try and protect everything and treat it as equal value? Or can you make a decision to uh, emphasize security in certain parts of the environment over others? And, and it's a tremendous, tremendously difficult uh, decision to make. Um, executives could posture and say that their information is, is important to someone else's. So you, you need a good framework to be able to discuss and tease out these issues and agree what really matters to the organization. And that then gets driven down in terms of uh, how do you technically go about managing and working things out. Uh, I give one example here. Um, some data could be very unimportant at a certain moment in time, but when it gets commingled or matched with another set of data, it could then become tremendously valuable. So, for example, test data on its own isn't that important. But if it's matched, say, with patent application information, it suddenly gives a, a tremendous signal to an attacker that this is very valuable information. And that's just hard to trace and track in a business which is operating at speed. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Richard. And for those of you that dialed in and listening, that's kind of how, how it's going to work as we go through uh, the different sections. I'll, I'll be uh, talking through a number of areas, and then I'll be switching and inviting Richard to provide some, some commentary from, from his, his experience and his perspective. So thanks, thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's move on. So next section I want to talk about, drilling down into a little bit more detail about the threat landscape. Uh, and also talking at the end about roles and responsibilities. So let's focus first at different types, different types of risks. Again, because I mentioned up front, we're a research and best practice insight organization. Here's some more data from a recent survey that we did. And this was a survey that we did uh, across um, CISOs, uh, so Chief Information Security Officers, and we asked them, asked them what threats do you rate uh, as high? And you can see here what the sequence of, of, of uh, risks uh, rated most highly by uh, CISOs. Um, we've colored them slightly different shades of blue. Uh, apologies if, if blue is a hard color for you to distinguish, but you can see there's a legend or a key on the right-hand side. And we've identified some of these are really people-based risks, some are third party, and some are technical. And don't worry if you don't understand all of the, the terms in here. If you're, if you're not, for example, immediately familiar with a watering hole attack towards the bottom down there or a zero-day attack, I, I will talk about zero-day attacks. But we have a, a glossary at the end of the presentation deck, so you can, uh, you can refer to those. But you can see phishing is the, the, the risk that came through uh, most frequently uh, rated as high. Um, so this is an email-based based attack where it's sent to typically quite a few people, um, and the idea is to lure you into opening the attachment or going to, to, going to a, web, a website. Um, a variation of that uh, is called whaling, uh, and that's where it's very much more focused on a particular individual, typically a senior executive, uh, and the, the phishing email is, is, has been customized because the, the hackers or the, 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 the attackers uh, have used social media to know more about that individual, what, what he or she likes, where he or she goes online, uh, what their hobbies are, or, or indeed perhaps some of their, their professional or, or personal history or characteristics. And so the phishing email is very customized. That, that particular type of attack is, is called whaling. Zero-day attack is using... Um, uh, vulnerabilities uh, in software uh, very early in the, the, the uh, launch uh, time of that software, so before the, the software is perhaps wide, widespread in its application and use, um, exploiting a, a known vulnerability uh, before the provider of that software uh, becomes aware of it and then can fix that, that hole. 
Um, so that's a zero day attack. Washing hole attack uh, is where um, you're, you're building uh, something which is attractive to sort of a, a known set of people that they're, they're likely to go uh, to a common web destination for a particular group of individuals uh, and by attracting them to that washing hole, that particular uh, attractive web uh, site that you know these people will, will want to go to, uh, you can get them to, uh, to click on the website and uh, there'll be some malware in there somewhere which will then uh, come into play. I'm not going to talk through all of these, uh, the idea being that it gives you a sense of uh, what your peer group, if you, uh, for your uh, CISO as a peer group, uh, think are the most significant, uh, the most significant risks. Um, let's just illustrate that by some examples. Uh, these are things that are in the public domain, so we're not uh, divulging any, any corporate secrets here. These are things that have been reported in the public domain uh, in recent months. You can see some very well-known organizations uh, listed here. So from the BBC, where there's a denial of service attack, uh, where their web servers for, for several hours uh, were unavailable. AT&T um, suffered uh, a problem as a result of a third party. Uh, where that third party was in a pro improperly accessed uh, and customer records were then sold. Um, the Library of Congress, the US Library of Congress, again had a denial of service attack. Uh, and you, you, can read, you can read the others on there. Um, so a variety of attacks. And if we ran this webinar in, in three months' time, we could have other well-known brands uh, listed, listed uh, up there as well. And if we ran it a year ago, there will be, there will be others as well. So uh, a fast-moving set of... Uh, iconic brands, well-known organizations that are still suffering from successful attacks. Motivations. Um, motivations to, to the, these attacks. Uh, this is not a one-for-one -one match. We've got some different examples here. You can see uh, four different examples at the bottom. Uh, blackmail was the, the rationale or the motivation uh, for the, the Sony Pictures uh, attack where people were uh, disgruntled about the theme of, of, of a particular film, uh, attacked Sony Pictures and, and were threatening to disrupt the release and circulation uh, of, of the film. Um, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian power grid um, was disrupted um, and electricity supply to citizens was disrupted. Uh, seemed to be in response to the political disruption in the country itself. Um, espionage um, Massive database being uh, stolen uh, from the U.S. Office of Personal Information, and I'm sure you all read the uh, Mossack Fonseca uh, story in the papers uh, during the course of 2016, uh, exposing uh, allegedly uh, shaky financial uh, banking type details uh, from some well-known people um, that have been trying to hide their, uh, their, their dealings uh, through using a Panama-based uh, firm of, of lawyers. So with this background and that sort of knowledge, um, organizations really need to do a deeper analysis, whether it's using root cause analysis or, or bow tie analysis, to really get a better understanding of what could be the causes behind a security incident and what would be the impact or consequences uh, of, of that uh, security impact. If you don't already use bow tie analysis, this is a simple illustrative example of a bow tie analysis. Why is it called bow tie analysis? Because it looks a little bit like, the diagram here looks a little bit like a bow tie. So we have a security incident. This is a very simple example we've put here. We have a security incident in the middle box. We, call, we have called it simply here, information risk event. To the left-hand side, we've identified four potential causes of that security event, from poor security hygiene, insecure employee behavior, poor third-party monitoring, and immature governance. And on the right-hand side, we've identified, again, just to keep it simple and symmetric, four outcomes of that risk event. In this particular case, for this organization, we've identi identified an operational outcome, a financial, a reputational, and strategic. Now, for any real organization, for any real uh, type of security event, you would get to a lower level of granularity and lower level of detail, both on the causes and the outcomes. But this is a very powerful tool. We see it frequently used. We certainly recommend its use to really help structure your analysis and your thinking uh, around what could be the cause of a particular event and what could be the outcome of a particular event. Just to make it a little more complex, 
Um, it's also worth uh, understanding that bow ties can be interconnected. What do I mean by that? I mean the outcome of one event could indeed be the cause of another. You could call it the domino effect is another way of describing the same thing, but uh, we could have a cause on the left hand side, an incident in the middle, an outcome on the right, and then that outcome triggers another event. So it becomes, an out one outcome becomes at the same time the cause of another event. So it's a way of, this is a way, a tool, a, a technique, if you like, a tactic of organizing your thinking, providing some structure uh, to help identify root causes uh, and some structure behind outcomes as well for, for a series of uh, information security events. So we recommend the use of bow tie analysis to help give you some structure. The second thing I wanted to talk about at, at this point is governance or roles and responsibilities. Who's involved in information security in your organization? In many of the organizations we work with, there is no shortage of activity and there is certainly no shortage of functions that are involved, whether we have uh, data privacy, compliance, ERM, information security, CISO team, internal audit, you might have legal, uh, HR might be involved in some parts, you might have a network manager, you might have a data manager. So there's a whole variety of people and it can start to look quite complicated. One way to think about it is uh, how we've de described it here, the three lines of defense model. Some of you may be familiar with the three lines of defense model, but let me just basically explain it. You can see we have three levels uh, d described or, or drawn on, on the, uh, the diagram on this page. At the very bottom, the first line. These are the people who are nearest uh, to the operational activity. Uh, they're, they're running lines of business. They're ru running uh, activities, whether it's in finance or a business unit. Uh, they're you know, people who are dealing with customers, they're creating and, and supplying products or services. Also, there's IT down in the first line because they're, they're uh, at that operational level. So these are where the risk ownership lies and the management of the risks. Second line of defense, as you move up the page, um, are functional teams, specialist areas, whether they're compliance or legal, privacy, HR. They're involved in writing policies, in training people. Uh, it can be involved in doing reviews to, to monitor implementation and uh, uh, successful management of those risks. Uh, certainly would be involved in investigations and incidents and, and follow-ups like that. that. And you can see there we've highlighted information security in dark blue and also ERM. And as we move up the page at the top, the third line defense, internal audit, have, have a remit to uh, provide assurance to the board that management of risk, including information security uh, as a risk, is being well managed in line with the cor corporation or the organization's appetite for taking of, of risk. And so the third party consists of, of internal audit. Now, that's quite a simple way of describing it. If you start thinking about specifically roles and responsibilities, it gets more complicated. As you can see here, we've kind of drilled down a level. If we start to say, uh, on the left-hand column, we've got some roles around identification of risk, that identification of risk appetite, defining roles, uh, identifying risks themselves, developing risk mitigation strategies, etc. And then we think about accountability and responsibility. And you can start to see there are multiple functions involved in most of those most of those areas. It starts to become more complicated. And in many organizations we work with, it's unclear. It is unclear uh, exactly who is accountable, who is responsible. Um, you can see, just taking one example there, um, defining roles and responsibilities, several teams are accountable. That that's almost seems like an oxymoron, that you, you really need a, a, few, a few people as possible res uh, accountable for something. Um, if they're truly going to be held to be accountable to making decisions and accountable should something should something go wrong. Uh, in some organizations, for example, where we've looked at data privacy, there are nine different functions who say we are responsible for data privacy in our organization. They cannot all be responsible for it. Um, and, and therefore there can be confusion, there can be overlap, there can be delays, there can be uncertainty where you have multiplicity of apparent uh, ownership uh, and responsibility. Again, let me pause here before I move on. Richard, bring, bring you back in, particularly on that, on that last point around roles and responsibilities, get your perspective and viewpoint on uh, how, that, how that could work better at organizations. 
in some senses, in smaller organisations, it's easier because um, just trying to find someone to be responsible, there, there are less candidates around. The bigger the organisation, the more complex it becomes and the more sophisticated you need to divide things up. I, I would say simply that, that defining roles and responsibilities is a distinct action point in its own right. It's not something to do as you go along. It's really a project. It requires stakeholdering, discussion, setting up of tables and, and, and really nailing things down. Um, so you should have a clear sense of what are the different jobs and tasks. They should be very practical and there should be lists of names going along this. You should have an idea of what responsibilities go across the organisation. So privacy, for example, is a, a very horizontal function. And then you should have an idea of what are the vertical jobs, you know, in which departments, in which operating processes and silos do things need to be, to be done. I think also you, you, you need to doubt, nail down this idea that there's accountability to, for the framework. We, we've often seen in the past where people think that some people are responsible, but then the issues get fudged. They kind of get confused and get lost. So I, I think simplicity is very important here. A lot of people go for a perfect set of tables and responsibilities. You know, a project like that could take a year to do, and, and everyone's forgotten by the end of it. So it should be very, very basic and simple. Get those things done right, and you can extend out as you go along. We all know that there's many ways to cook in eggs, and there's, I think, many ways to split responsibilities here. So don't, don't try and uh, aim at something perfect. Just do something which works in your organization, and then after three months or six months, seek to improve and refine as you go along. How's that? That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it, absolutely. I would, I would echo that. It's important. Uh, it's better to start and, and evolve rather than to, to, to design design something perfect and, and spend an awful lot, awful long time time doing that. It, uh, it creates an awful lot of frustration for people, yeah. doesn't it? I think it's much easier to try something, have a go, experiment, and improve as you go along. I think you get more buy-in and support as you progress. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you, Richard, for that. All right. Let's move on to the, the third area. Some of the things that can can help you. Um, there are standards and regulations, um, and I just want to uh, make sure that you're aware of, of some of the most, most common. Because um, the reason these, these can help you is because there are experts that have already thought about, so what are the key components of a good approach to information security? Um, so you can leverage um, some expertise uh, and some, some well thought out uh, approaches, rather than having to, to start from scratch and to create your own, if you like. Um, no, I'm not going to say it's a dilemma. The, the, the situation is, is there is a, a quite a variety to choose from. Let me, let me show you some in, on the very next page. Uh, here, here again is some information from a survey we carried out uh, again across uh, information security. You can see at the bottom left, we, on each of our, our bar charts like this, we have an N equals. That tells you how many people participated in the survey. You can see here there was 96 uh, security or information security officers participated in this particular survey. So there's a variety of, uh, of standards uh, and security frameworks that are being deployed. So let me just briefly take you across. The ISO standard is an international standard. Uh, many of you, again, I, I suspect are familiar with the Information Standards Organization and 27001 and 27002 um, for uh, information security standards. The, the next one along is from the um, National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the U.S. Department of, of Commerce, uh, and that's their cybersecurity framework. Uh, C2M2 is uh, specifically for energy companies. That's uh, from the U.S. Department of Energy. That's their cybersecurity maturity model. Um, the NIST has got a second uh, standard, and that's for security and privacy. Uh, for U.S. federal systems. COVID is an international uh, standard uh, that's, that's uh, adopted um, outside of the U.S. As, as well as inside of the U.S. Um, ISF is the Interna sorry, Information Security Forum, and that's their standards of good practice. Uh, the next one along from left to right, uh, the SANS Institute, uh, that's their critical security controls for effective cyber uh, defense. The next one, FFIEC, is the Federal Financial Institution Exam Office, their cybersecurity assessment tool. COSO is another um, uh, framework uh, that's not just restricted to um, 
to information security, that's more around uh, governance of organizations, but information security is a key part. Um, if you Googled any of those acronyms, you'd get much more information about them, so if you want to find out more. But you can see ISO is, is the most popular uh, at 37%, um, so that is one of the, the most popular um, information security standards. And there's a little bit more information in, in the narrative that's, uh, that's on here, um, so you can see ISO, uh, and these standards from ISO are updated on a regular basis. And the NIST, I mentioned, that's from the U.S. Department of Commerce. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy produces the C2M2, uh, and then there's a health information one uh, you can see on the on the right-hand side there. So there are international um, standards. There are some which are national, and there are some which are related to a specific sector. So if you're in the energy sector or if you're in uh, another sector, there may be a standard that, that applies uh, and is particularly relevant for you. In addition to, to standards, uh, I want to talk about um, some regulations or some laws, because um, clearly you need to be complying with the relevant laws. And here's just some illustrations of recent uh, laws and, and regulations in different countries. In South Africa, uh, protection of personal information was introduced a couple of years ago. Um, familiar in many of its um, uh, requirements to EU data protection legislation or protection of personal information in, in Europe. So. Uh, the, the concepts and the requirements are familiar to, to us from that respect. Uh, the US has got a Cybersecurity Act introduced a couple of years ago. Um, in the EU, in, in a, one of the recent laws is the, the NIS directive, you can, you can see there. Um, there are others uh, around personal information, of course, uh, in the EU. And Australia um, had uh, an amendment to its Privacy Act a couple of years ago as well. Um, so there are laws which uh, place requirements upon you and there are standards which can help you achieve those, uh, achieve the, the, the uh, uh, processes and procedures that you need to comply with those, those regulations uh, and, and the laws. So again, let me, let me pause here and invite Richard to, to make a comment on laws and regulations and how uh, important those are to, to different organizations. Well, one of the great challenges for global organizations is they're exposed to a wide range of legislation, uh, and sometimes that they can be in contrast or have different points of emphasis, so it's very um, uh, challenging to be able to be fully compliant with these at all times. And, and the important thing to realize, this is also a very dynamic space. The, these laws are changing regularly. One of the things that we can say about information security is it's not highly polarized in the political environment. It's certainly an area where politicians believe that they can be doing some service to help and support the lives of citizens without there being um, a sense of opposition from parties. You know, it's not an issue which separates people, say, like protection of life or something like this. So it's an area where politicians like to be very, very active. So one of the things that we would say is that you would really need to get help in terms of monitoring um, all of the, the laws in the environments in which you're operating um, so you can get um, subscriptions to legal companies that, that help you stay uh, abreast of the most important changes in legislation in this area. I think if you're involved in um, enterprise risk management or information security risk, you've already got your hands full. So this is a, a really a specialist service that you should be um, getting hold of. If you have large in-house counsel, maybe you can do it. But typically, you should be kept aware of changes so that you can plan and prepare for them because they can require significant changes to your operating practices over time. Great, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, a couple of things uh, in terms of logistics. Um, this, this webinar is, is being recorded, um, so if you'd like to hear us talking again, then you can certainly do that, or if you wanted to share it with uh, any colleagues who weren't able to, to join us uh, today to, to listen to the webinar live, um, so the IRM uh, will be uh, making that uh, recording available to everybody. And as I mentioned up front, um, at the end of the, the session, there's a URL so you can uh, download the, the PDF version of the presentation um, without us talking, but the, the, you, you can uh, access the slides. So if, again, if you wanted to use any of these slides in any presentation or update uh, or share them with your team, uh, then th those will be available to you as well. So just a, a reminder on a couple of uh, logistical things there. All right, now let's turn to the next section, which is around, so with that as a background, what should ERM uh, be doing? 
And really there's, there's three parts to what I want to talk about here. I want to talk about uh, three companies that, that we've worked with, and I'm going to give you an insight into uh, how they have approached a particular aspect of information security. Second thing I want to do is share with you uh, three uh, sets of questions which you can use, you can take away, and you can use these to start evaluating uh, in a couple of ways uh, your information security. So you can use it to as a start as a checklist, you can uh, use it to uh, challenge management, but you could also, for example, use it for or provide it to your audit committee or your risk committee chair and they can use it as their aid memoir when they are providing oversight and challenge to executive management on information security. And then the third thing I want to do again is turn, turn to Richard for uh, additional uh, input and commentary on uh, how he sees uh, ERM, what, what he sees ERM's key role uh, to be in, in this area. So let's, let's make a start on, on this piece. Um, three different components I mentioned right up front, people, technology, and governance. And I want to illustrate uh, an approach, a very effective approach from three different companies in each of those three areas. I want to talk a little bit about Salesforce, which is a California-based uh, software company, uh, Symantec, uh, which is a security software company, and Intuit. Um, and Intuit, oh, let me just remind myself what they are. They're, again, they're a software company. Um, uh, so they just kind of a summary on the page here, because many of you are not members and not paid up clients of uh, CB. I can't provide a lot of detail about these clients. Each of these are detailed case studies where we have agreed with Salesforce and Semantic and Intuit how we will describe their innovative best practice and that's shared and available across our global membership. Um, I'm going to give you a, a verbal insight uh, in, into what they've done. So let's take it from left to right. People, I've mentioned a couple of times how important people are as an adjunct to technology. You can solve part of the information security risk by technology, but only part of it. You have to have people performing well and behaving in, in a good way. That raises an immediate question, well, what do we mean by good and how do we measure if people are doing things in an appropriate way? That's the essence of what Salesforce have done. They have worked really hard to create an environment uh, in their organization where people understand, every employee understands what does it mean to, to behave well? What does it what, what is required of me, irrespective of my role, irrespective of my place in the hierarchy in the organization. People have been trained and motivated, and they try and make it fun, so uh, there are games and there are prizes and there are rewards. They try and try and make it a little bit more than just uh, the um, sort of edict from on high with a new policy and the online training that we're all compelled to, to sit and pass the little exam at the end. So Salesforce have, have tried to make it more dynamic, more fun, uh, and more, more interesting, and therefore to really get people bought into uh, and understanding and behaving in the right way. How have they done that? Well, they started off by saying, well, what do we mean by secure behavior? And they spent quite a bit of time brainstorming. What does what would secure behaviour mean? What, if we're trying to drive people, we're trying to get people, coach them, and encourage them to behave well, what do we mean by behave well in our organisation? And they they started off this brainstorming activity, and they developed, as you would imagine, a pretty long list of what it could be. And they said, well, we, we can't possibly have a sort of training, coaching, development um, sessions which are trying to get people to do so many different things. We need to distill this down. They distilled it down to five behaviors. Um, it's a dynamic list. The, the set of things, set of five evolves over time, but there are only five things in the list. It's a manageable number uh, in terms of how they're going to explain it, uh, empower people, encourage, train people, however you want to describe it, to understand and do the right thing. Let me give you some examples. Uh, one is see something, say something. That's one of the behaviors they want people to understand and embrace and to live by. So if you see something which is insecure in some way, and, it's exp they exp and spend time explaining what they mean in some way, it's up to you to say something and get it fixed. It's not someone else's job. You have to speak up. It's, it's akin to, if you imagine, on a production line, um, that employees in, in some companies on the production line, th any employee on the production line, if they see something which is going to be dangerous to a fellow employee 
all going to result in a poor quality product being created on the production line. They have the responsibility to stop the production line and get that thing fixed. Same sort of concept, this is in an office environment, a software and services company. So if you see something, you say something. A uh, second one, I can't tell you about what, what they all are. Uh, the second one, which I think is fascinating, is say no to badge surfing. Uh, many of you will work in organizations, as we do, where we have security uh, badges and we have uh, access control at the doors. And there's often someone who wants to tag along behind you uh, as you open the door and they've got a cup of coffee and a bag and this, that and the other and they can't quite get their badge out and you just kindly leave the door open and, and let them in or hold the door open and, and let them in. At, at Salesforce, they spend a lot of time um, educating people that that is inappropriate. It's not rude to close the door behind you or close the turnstile behind you. If that person is, is authorized to, to enter that floor or that building, they'll have a badge which, which enables them to do that. Um, and this is one of the areas where they try and make it uh, a little more fun. Um, so they select individuals and they give them a task. And they'll give an individual a task saying, you're not normally entitled to go onto this particular floor. Say, let's say floor five. Uh, you're normally working on floor three. Your badge wouldn't access the door on floor four or five. We want you to see if you can get onto floor five uh, by you know, uh, tagging along behind the group, uh, by seeing if anybody wedges the door open first thing in the morning or, or late, late in the afternoon, whatever it might be. And if you can get onto that floor, you will be rewarded. Uh, simple thing, you will either get like a baseball cap or you'll get a hoodie or something like that uh, with, with a slogan on the hat or a slogan on, the, on the, uh, the hoodie. And conversely, if you see someone that's walking around on your floor you don't recognize, you're encouraged to challenge them. Um, and you will get rewarded if you successfully challenge an individual that should not be on, on your floor. So there's a number of different ways. And then, so they have those five behaviors. They, I've, I've illustrated it with, with a couple of them. And then how do they measure whether people are behaving in the right way? Again, they thought about a range of different metrics. Uh, they wanted to keep it simple. Uh, and the metric they decided upon was the number of reports raised by employees regarding suspected security issues. That's their metric for seeing, for gauging how well their security messages are getting across to their employees. The thinking being, um, if we have an increasing number, after we've done this training, increasing number of security incidents being reported, that means people are being more diligent, more vigilant, being more, more aware. Whether they are confirmed or unconfirmed, whether they're substantiated or unsubstantiated, they want to encourage all concerns to be reported. So that's one, one way, one example from one company uh, where we found uh, a great tactic, very effective, very innovative for driving improvement on that behavior dimension. On the technology, uh, on the technology side, uh, an illustration from Symantec. You, I'm not going to tell you to keep your software up to date. I'm not going to tell you to have antivirus software or anything like that. That's so obvious. You'll all be doing it. The key thing here is how do they, they kind of build the message, uh, understand what needs to be done, uh, provide some structure and clarity around their thinking and then measure how successful their technology part of the response has been. So what Symantec have done is they've identified their top threats. They've identified how would we measure whether we are uh, exposed to or defending well against, secure against these, these top threats. So they've identified some KPIs and metrics. So I'll give you one example. One of their top threats, you'll not be surprised to hear, network compromise. Uh, the risk of uh, a, a, an unwanted third party breaching their security and compromising their, their network. Uh, and they've identified um, a number of metrics which help them uh, assess and manage and monitor uh, how serious that, that risk is uh, and whether it's actually crystallized and inc incidents uh, have occurred. So network compromise is one of their threat categories. System failure is another. Um, I I'm not going to tell you all of them. Uh, and regulatory risk uh, is, is a third one. So they've identified their major information security risks into six broad themes. Those are uh, sub subdivided into specific KPIs, each of which have got operational metrics against them. So they discussed, debated, and agreed. Those are their most important security risks, and this is how we are going to measure, if you like, the state of health uh, against each of, those, each of those security risks. 
Uh, finally, on the governance piece, um, what Intuit have done is build on that point that we were talking about earlier that, that I talked about and, and Richard also commented on about the importance for roles and responsibilities of clarity of, of who is actually responsible for what in this complex and in interconnected uh, world of information security. So they have clarified across communications, technology, uh, Exco members, security, ERM, and the business units, they've worked hard to clarify exactly who is responsible, responsible for what in terms of information security, in terms of building the framework, but also in terms of uh, detecting any breaches and responding to incidents uh, and events. Uh, and they use that uh, to, to be a kind of a learning process so as, as and when things do occur, and they do occur, um, they respond to those incidents and crisis. Uh, they learn, learn from how they occurred, uh, how we responded, and what we need to do uh, better go going forward. So they, they thought about the governance piece, Symantec we focus on uh, from a technology perspective, and then Salesforce I mentioned, thinking about the people. And I would recommend that your information security approach has those three components. You think about that roles and responsibility and governance, you think about the technology, and you think about the people piece. And to help you do that, we've got three, uh, I'm going to say top 10, but they're not, because a couple of them have got 11 questions on. So we've got three pages, each of which have got 10 or 11 questions on. This one is around that governance or that information security oversight. So these are questions that you as an ERM person could use to evaluate the state of health right now. Uh, you could, as I say, uh, challenge this CISO and other members of the information security team to see how well they're doing that. Or, as I mentioned, also you could provide this and coach your uh, c chair of your risk committee, chair of your audit committee for him or her to use this to challenge management in, in the next meeting. I'm not going to read all these questions out. They're in the, in the material. This is a very tactical uh, way for you to uh, take some action following on from uh, today's webinar. So some questions here about... Uh, security oversight of governance, um, how issues are identified and responded to, and overall effectiveness of information security. Second set of questions is all around that employee, that behavior question. Um, so how do we define secure behaviors? How do we measure the effectiveness of training and awareness? How do we respond to insecure behavior? And how do we drive secure behavior amongst third parties? And the final set of, third, uh, of 10 questions, or indeed 11 on this particular case, is looking to the future. Uh, it's good to be secure today, but it's a fast-moving world, as we spoke about in some of the introductory pages. Uh, and you need also uh, to be thinking about tomorrow's threat, next week's threat. Is your security framework going to be sufficient uh, as you go forward, or are you always going to be playing catch-up? So uh, in some way, either inside your organization or by... Uh, uh, subscription to uh, a consulting type service, an information type service, thinking about and being aware of how the threat environment that's relevant to you, the software, the systems, the data, the organization that, that you are, um, thinking about those emerging, monitoring and, and assessing those emerging risks. Um, emerging risks there, uh, thinking particularly about in the middle of the page, the high value, the most high value information assets, something Richard mentioned earlier on, um, focused most of your security on your most important uh, assets uh, and respond appropriately um, to, those, to those threats. So th the idea of these, these three pages is to give you something very tactical, very pragmatic, ready to use now. You might want to adjust one or two of those questions. You might want to add a question, but it's a fantastic, uh, fast starting point for you to really uh, drive or assess and then assess your current status uh, and drive improvements uh, going forward. So, as I said, I wanted just to pause here. Richard, what would you add in terms of key priority areas or tasks? What would you put on the to-do list, if you like, of ERM teams uh, over and above what, what, I've, uh, what I've mentioned already in this last section? Well, I think um, a statistic you raised right at the top of the presentation should terrify people. And that was where it said that good information security hygiene can present, prevent 94% of incidents. Uh, and what about the 6%? And, and of course, a statistic like that is based upon frequency. The more frequently you're attacked, the more likely people are to um, experience an incident. Uh, I think information security and risk management are 
have traditionally been predicated on the, the basis of stop bad stuff from happening inside our organization. And I think the game has really changed now. It's no longer possible to stop bad things from happening. You have to appreciate and realize that bad things are going to happen. And so the second part of risk management is about reducing the impact of things when they go wrong. And that's very important because a lot of the people that we work with in the first line of defense, they're busy dealing with today's problems, operational realities and issues. And we have to help to work into their thinking that they really need to prepare for these kind of problems, bringing together issues like business continuity management, incident and crisis management, helping our information security colleagues to get into the heads of people within the business that these things need to be prepared for. We need to be a lot more proactive and expect things to go wrong. A, a second part that needs to be understood is that most organizations don't know when they've been hacked. An incident may have already happened and you simply aren't aware of it. Like a physical security incident, you would end up with something damaged or stolen. You know, you've got real evidence of it. In a digital environment, you may have lost your crown jewels and never even realize it. So we need to help people understand and unpack what that means and really get concerted action coming forward. And that's not easy to do. But for many executives who've never experienced an information security breach, it could seem like hyperbole, a very theoretical problem, and that they don't really become engaged and take action. So there is a sense we need to go into our organizations and help update the mindsets and attitudes that people commit attention and resources to moving forward. Ian. Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Richard. That, that's great. Um, and we're, we're coming toward, towards the end. There's a couple more things I want, I want to do. Um, let me just advance to the next page. Richard, let me just turn back to you because I know, I know you're building, to, uh, building up to, to run a course for the IRM on exactly this topic in, in more detail and in about a month's time. Um, do, do you want to just say a few words about the course? We've got a slide here. Which, do you want to say a few words uh, about the course? I'm sure many of the people who are on the webinar or their colleagues would be interested in, in more detail. Oh, great, thanks. I, I think one of the difficult things is it's very difficult to understand how bad is this problem really. It can seem when people talk about information security like we're all crying wolf and we're all going to claim that the sky is going to fall down on our heads. And it doesn't look like our everyday experience is like that. Sure, we see lots of stuff in the papers, but how bad is the problem really? How do we start to measure and gauge this so that we can communicate this risk in a rational way to executives without appearing like we're, we're, we're being alarmist or, or even complacent. Uh, and secondly, is it really possible to achieve perfect information security? Can, can we give promises and assurances that, that no information will ever be lost? Is that even realistic anymore? And if it's not, what, what's appropriate in security really look like? How do we even begin to start to describe this? And, 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 and finally, how do we integrate this deeper issue of information security disciplines, which seems very technical, uh, very embedded within the IT environment? How do we get people to care about that in business? Uh, it's very tempting to say, well, we just let the techies take care of that and we, we don't care. But I think most organizations would now say that it requires real partnership between technical people and business units to get this right. No longer can we, we just rely on outsourcing this to the IT department. So uh, a lot of the course will be talking about some practical strategies where we can help to make sense of this problem and, and to take uh, practical steps to improve the situation. And hopefully it'll be a bit of fun along the way. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Richard. Right, let's just move on. Uh, very final, very final slide. As I mentioned uh, up front and reminded you halfway through, the, you can download the slides. There is the, uh, the, um, the link to, to do that. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and that will be made available through the IRM. I also want to get, uh, as I'm just closing, closing out the session, I think if I click on this ratings, uh, I'm trying to work out how this happens. I don't think that's going to be the way to, I think, I think when I close the webcast, um, you're going to be invited to uh, to submit your evaluation, uh, just a simple uh, number, uh, and of course we're striving to, to deliver a, a great webinar, which is good use of your time, has delivered some insight uh, and uh, information that not only is interesting, but you can actually take 
action on and a key thing that, that here at CB we're very focused on. Uh, we want to educate, want to entertain, of course, uh, but we want you to take action uh, based on what uh, what we've been talking about. So I'm hoping that the, what I've been saying and also what, what Richard's been contributing to, to the 60 minutes we've, we've had together has both been interesting and valuable and enabled you to, to take action. Uh, there's a lot of data in there on a number of the pages we've provided uh, great set of, of data around the problem, why it is more urgent now, the types of issues that people are facing, uh, motivations, examples of attacks, standards, legislation, and then we closed by, uh, I think that the core of what, uh, what we, we needed to speak about is how can you take action, what is the role of ERM to really drive improvement in, in your organization. Uh, and just, just a final reminder, um, Key terms, remember I mentioned there's a glossary. Well, here is that glossary uh, at the back if you want to know what a watering hole slide is, etc. It, it's all there. Um, so all of the information hopefully is going to be self-contained in this presentation. We're right up against time, uh, and so I'm going to uh, close the webinar now. Thank you very much for your uh, participation, for joining uh, and taking part in the webinar. Uh, Richard, thank you very much for taking the thank time you. to join us. Great insights. Good luck with the course uh, next month. I'm sure it's going to go very, very thank well. Thank you very much. And I'm now going to bring the webinar to a close. Thank you indeed, everybody. Good luck, everyone. Bye.